Welcome once again to, yes, that's right, Unstoppable Mindset, where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet. Today, we get to meet and talk with an award-winning international author. Um, I don't know whether she writes about internationals, whatever they are, but but we'll find <laughs> out. Anyway, Diane floyd Bain, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, international, because uh, I've lived in several countries and have traveled a lot, and and so the books are sold in different different countries, and I'm really proud of that. Oh, cool. Do you publish them yourself, or do you have a publisher? Um, actually, I'm very blessed. I have two publishers, OC Publishing out of Canada and Texas Sister Press, obviously out of Texas. So how lucky is that? It took a long that time is, to get here. <laughs> that is as good as it gets. Do the publishers war with each other? Do they care? They are very kind to one another. <laughs> so oh, good. Yeah. It's, you know, that is that is blessed. How many books have you written? I have uh, nine books and I have two more coming out, one in the um, August, late fall, um, late summer, I should say, sorry. And then in uh, October, the second book. Well, cool. Well, we'll get to, to more of that, but why don't we start with the usual things that it's fun to hear about, and that is you growing up and so on. So where did you grow up and do you have siblings or anything like that or any of that sort of stuff that you'd like to tell us? Sure. Um, I love talking about my family. Um, so I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but as the saying goes, we got to Texas as fast as we could. No, actually, Oklahoma is a lovely state. And But mom and daddy, uh, job-wise, daddy ended up in um, Houston. And so uh, we moved to um, Texas, and I grew up in Deer Park, Texas, and later on, I became Miss Deer Park, <laughs> and so that oh, was pretty cool. Cool. 1977, and it's a it's a wonderful, wonderful city to grow up in. And I have five siblings, which gives me lots of insight to having five brothers and having a feel for uh, uh, what boys might say, especially when they were dating. <laughs> <laughs> and what else? Mom and daddy, um, best parents ever one could ask for. Hardworking. I mean, we didn't get everything we wanted because, you know, they have six mouths to feed, but that's how you learn to appreciate life. You know, you start babysitting if you want something or, you know, you get a job at 16 so that you learn the value of the dollar. And I really appreciated all that. So, Not how so much did one growing up? <laughs> So how did you get to be Miss Deer Park? How did that work out? Um, it wasn't it wasn't like I was uh, trying to um, do those things, uh, meaning contests, but um, a neighbor uh, that I used to babysit for, uh, Mrs. Bedford, she said she was uh, going to be starting the Miss San uh, Jacinto, which is a college out here or out there because I moved. Um, and would I like to be in it? And I was like, uh, no, because I'm not pretty. <laughs> and then when she said, well, they're going to have a, a talent show and you can win scholarships for college. And then my ears perked up Ooh, because I, yes. I wanted to go to college. And when I found out that um, you would develop interview skills and things that could help you for the future, I latched on to that and tried to enter as many college based um uh, contests that I could. And I won a few. And um and I lost them even more, but that's how you learn. You need to lose so you learn and improve. And um, developing those interview skills has helped me all through my life so far. And hence, look where I'm at. There you go. Where do you live now, by the way? You said you moved. Yes. So, um, I mean, I've lived in a lot of places, but we've raised our children in Austin, Texas. Ah, okay. So I'm in the hill country and I love it. So are you in Austin? Yes. Well, I'm in the hill section in Travis County where the hills start to begin. So it's the beginning of the hill country. So it's really, I, really pretty. I haven't been in touch for a couple of years, but have you ever eaten at a restaurant in Austin called the Blind Goat? 
You know, people are talking about that one, and I have not, but I am going to make a point to do that. Christine Ha, who started that restaurant, was the winner on Master Chef uh, in, I think, oh. 2011. She is blind. She's the only blind person, to my knowledge, who has ever won that. She beat out, I think, something like 18,000 people to do it. Wow. Uh, and and so um, I haven't corresponded with her for a while, but if you get a chance, I'd love to hear what you think of it, since you're closer than we are. <laughs> I will make a point to do that. Thank you for telling me, and, and kudos for her. Um, a, she must be an excellent chef, but to beat out that many people is extraordinary, and it shows you that um, when you want something, you don't let anything stop you. Exactly right. So one girl and five brothers, that must have been a lot of fun. It was a blast. And, you know, I feel very grateful to grown up in the time period that I did. Um, I had two older brothers and then three younger. So I had, you know, siblings that I got to change their diapers and stuff because they were much younger than me. So they were my dollies. But it's a great (laughs) learning experience. And it also made sure that I wasn't boy crazy because I really know what boys were all about. (laughs) And I'll bet they kind of monitored you too, the older ones especially. Oh, my gosh. Do I have stories for you? It wasn't (laughs) until about I didn't really date that much, um, especially in high school. And I always thought it was because I was so ugly because my brothers would always be telling me I was fat and ugly. And of course, I believed them because they were family. Right. And uh, and I was one of these girls that, you know, just like people said that, then it must be true. So um, then my brother, Danny, told me about four years ago. He said, you know, Diane, um, you know how you didn't really date that much in high school? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, I have a confession to make. I told the boys that they even looked at you that I would punch them. Uh-huh. <laughs> so there you go. Well, there you are. And uh, <laughs> so your, your, your husband had a gauntlet to go through, huh? Oh, well, that is a funny <laughs> story, too, because all my brothers um, were fantastic at sports and some of them became uh, coaches in the neighborhood and so forth. And or else they were also a coach for um, schools. And so along comes my husband and they you say, you know, what sport do you play? And of course, he's like, oh, I go fishing and um, I'm a a third degree black belt. And I do, you know, (laughs) a bunch of stuff. And they're thinking, okay, that's not football and it's not basketball and it's not baseball. So he's, yeah, he's not going to make it in the family. And um, so they didn't pay attention to him anymore. And so he just kind of slid right in, (laughs) but they love him. (laughs) So what can I say? He's really smart. Well, so that worked out okay. Well, that's a good thing. Well, so did you mostly just grow up um, in Texas or did you, uh, when did you start to travel abroad? I guess is probably a better way to put the question. Sure. Yes, I grew up in Texas. And actually, when my husband became a diplomat, our first year of marriage was in Virginia. And um, it was my, I'd always gone to Oklahoma because that's where my daddy um family was and on my mom's side they had already moved to texas and so that was my only experience really of uh, being out of texas so when we moved to virginia it was very different for me and i remember um calling my dad and um just checking in as you know kids do with their parents, especially on Sundays and daddy so my nickname was sug with him for short for sugar And he said, so Suge, how are things going? And I'm like, daddy, you won't believe this place. It must be like living in a foreign country. Do you know they make you pay for parking just to see your doctor? (laughs) So anyway, I think that was funny. (laughs) My daddy was like, oh, you poor thing. (laughs) Well, you think it was bad there? You should have been in New York, but go ahead. (laughs) No, 
<laughs> but um, it was my husband, as I said, being a diplomat that took us um, to be able to see the world. And we lived in the Philippines for three years and, you know, traveled a lot of places there, which I dearly loved. And I love the Filipino people. And then um, fast forward, um, um, he became a lawyer in Texas and that's where we raised our kids. And then one day he received a phone call. How would you like to move to Dubai? So we um, moved to Dubai and lived there 14 years. And that allowed me to um, travel um, quite a bit in Europe and Africa and parts of Asia. So I feel very blessed. What prompted the move to Dubai? What was the reason that they called him and wanted him to do that? Because he wasn't a diplomat then, was he? Or No, he wasn't. But um, he, the law firm that he's working for at the time, Fulbright and Jaworski, wanted to open up um, a firm there. So they purchased one and then they uh, opened up a new firm in Saudi Arabia. And my husband um, became part of that hope oh, cool. experience. Yeah, it was awesome. So what was it like living in the Philippines and like living in Dubai and like living in Virginia as opposed to living in Texas? <laughs> it's an eye opener. It, it really is. Yeah. But it is I fun to live people. in various parts. Of, it is fun to live in various parts of the United States. I've had the pleasure of spending years in Massachusetts and in New Jersey. And then during a, a project that I worked on in the Mid to late 1970s, I spent time in Iowa and New York and Colorado. So I've had, and as a speaker, I've had the opportunity to travel all over the country. And it it is wonderful just to see all the different kinds of experiences. I love our country. I, I absolutely love the United States. And every state is so beautiful and there's something so positive to say about each state. And I think as an American, and it's important for us to um, get to know the different states because each state has things that they, um, they, they do that are so important that help uh, help each one of us. And um and, and so I can't say enough. I've been in all the states except for Hawaii. I really need to go to Hawaii. And then I need to spend a little bit more time in Wisconsin. I haven't spent enough time there. Um, but also living in the Philippines, in answer to your question, um, wow, what beautiful people they are. They, I just love the Philippines. I love the people. I was able to teach school there as well as be one of the first Americans um, in the, the the national theater there and be in several of their musicals. And then in Dubai, how lucky to be able to be in the Middle East, get to know the people, understand the customs and um, meet people from all over the world. I think there's like 172 different nationalities in that country, all working um, beautifully together. And so um, I can't say enough about Dubai as well and the opportunities it gave me to travel. So when you were overseas and then, of course, when you when you moved back, what did you do? So your husband was diplomating and lawyering. And what did mm. you do? Excellent question. Before we left, I was, my background is uh, education. I was a teacher and um, I uh, was one of the, there were several of us teachers who knew how to turn on a computer and a lot of people didn't. And so we helped launch um, bringing computers in the classroom, um, discovering what software would work with different um subjects for curriculum. And then I started training teachers and computers. So by the time that happened, I was traveling quite a bit around um, the country um, in the schools, which gave me a real feel for different states. And then um, I had to reinvent myself when we moved to Dubai. And that allowed me to do something I always wanted to be able to do, which was humanitarian work. And so that led me to Africa, where I spent a lot of time in Ethiopia, Uganda, and uh, Kenya. And um, so how exciting is that, right? Right. Well, when you say humanitarian work, what did you do? 
I mostly was in the um, orphanages helping and um, learning how the orphanages worked and finding out ways that I could, um, I and people who were with me could assist in um, helping the orphans have food and clothing and so forth. In uh, Kenya and Uganda, I was predominantly in um, the schools and um, in a couple of the schools, I helped uh, do some projects where we um, helped provide shoes, gathered shoes, took them there. It was a whole process. And in another school, I ran a project where um, we helped girls. If you can imagine, some girls were 14 and 15 and they never owned um, a bra. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I still get I still get embarrassed when I say things, you know, I'm modest. Um, and that was an exciting, um, that was an exciting process. Um, another time we ran a uh, project where we provided um, dresses um, for the girls to have um, church, church dresses. And then for the boys, we provided um, some uh, slacks. Um, actually, for them, they would be more uh, long shorts. And um, they were made out of pillowcases. And my quilting group made all the um, all the dresses or skirts and uh, pants. So that was really exciting. And I had a team um, helping me and also bringing them to the schools. So it was exciting. In, in all of your travels, what was maybe the most scariest thing you ever had to encounter? Gee whiz, I'd have to think. Um, you know, I, we, we were with people who really understood the country and we were always with people that were our guides. And so I actually never was afraid of anything. So, and we went way out into the barrios. I think the only time I might have was afraid when my husband decided that he wanted to take our Dotson and um, head for this volcano that had not uh, erupted in many, many years. And then he decided to take a back street and this back street was not a street and we were driving through the jungle and I didn't know if we were ever going to get out. <laughs> so that was <laughs> an experience with my husband. So, But you never really encountered bad people or, or kind of difficult things like that in, in any of your travels? No, no. I was very lucky. Well, so you, you traveled, um, mm-hmm. you came back, and when you came back from Dubai, did you go back to teaching? Did you do more humanitarian work or what? Well, before I left, I was already working on, um, t- I've always been a storyteller, and I had decided I really wanted to take my stories and put them to print, and so I was in that process. So when I was over in Dubai, I uh, really worked hard to figure out how to make things happen and started also taking art lessons so that maybe I could do simple illustrations for some of the books that I, um, I now have published. And so when I came back, I became published in uh, Dubai, actually. But when I came back home, I really concentrated on um, writing even more books and learning this um, whole skill of how to be an author and the craftsmanship and so forth. And that's where I'm at. I do go to the schools as an invited author. And I like, um, give. I mean, I just, when I'm in school, in schools with kiddos, even all the way up to 12th grade, I'm in my element because I have an opportunity to let each one of them know to love themselves, believe in themselves and go after it. And if I can walk away and made a difference in their life, then I'm very, very excited. So nowadays, do you write full time? Um, Pretty much. If I'm not writing, I'm in the garden or I, my dog, I should say my husband's and my dog. Um, (laughs) He's a cow dog and he's a rescue. And I can tell um, it was my um, son's uh, wife's family who found him. 
and uh, they actually have a small ranch. And Remy was used to having days where he could ride around and get out to the cows. So he gets really, or she gets very excited if she gets to go on a drive. So besides walking her, she gets her daily dose of riding in the car and she gets very excited. (laughs) Well, that's important, you know. Yeah, I like to keep my, I, I love my dog. She's amazing. Matter of fact, she's just sitting right outside waiting, like, what are we going to do next? Yeah. Don't I get to be part of the interview? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she start licking the screen. <laughs> so you started writing and you said you actually got published in Dubai. What kind of a book was it that, that you got published in Dubai? Um, It was um, Harry the Camel, a children's book, and um, OC Publishing out of Canada um, took it on, and that was very exciting. I wanted to um, write a book about a camel, and I'd been wanting to do it for some time, and so they published that, and then they published um, right away from when I was in Dubai, the series, it's a series now, The Little Girl in the Moon. And um, that's morphed into the Moonling Adventures. So, yay. So how many books have you had published all together now? Nine. Nine and what kind, of bo- what kind of books are they primarily? The majority are children's books. Um, and then I have my very first uh, young adult historical fiction based on my grandma. It's right here. Ruby, <laughs> Rise, A Girl Struggle for More, and that's my grandmother on the cover. And my books are about um, believing in yourselves, imagination, being kind to others, even if they're different. And in the case of Rise, A Girl Struggle for More, that particular book is to inspire people to go after your dreams. So if if a girl born in 1904, where life is so, so different for young men and young women, then, um, and, and she can make her dream come true, which was to be a businesswoman at the time, which was not, you know, very common, especially down South, um, if I could say that. And, um, at least in her area, I should qualify that, then you can then you can do that too. And that's really important to me. When schools are as big as they are, especially in high school, it's in junior high, it's easy to get lost. And um, I want kids to know that they are special and whatever your dream is, just stay focused and be persistent. I mean, if I can do it, I feel like um, you can too. And I always tell the kids, look, I grew up in a small house compared to today's homes. Um, many can imagine, you know, six kids, a mom and dad and one bathroom. <laughs> um, but it's not about how much you have or it's a, or how little you have. It's about what if you really want something Let's map out a goal and figure out how to make it happen. Good advice. And, you know, we, we often just allow ourselves to be diverted or we, we tend to think, oh, we can't do something. And how do, we, how do we change that mindset with people? Obviously, you're contributing to that by writing the books that you're writing. But in general, how we, do we get people to recognize that Probably they can do a lot more than they think they could. Yeah, that's really true. And and um, I really believe that the first thing we can do is to be a good listener. So love yourself, but be a good listener. And if we could all become a better listener and not really want to jump in and say, okay, okay, you've had your you had your say now listen to me because I really know the answers, right? That's not being a good listener because if you're a good listener, then you're going to be learning and figuring out how to work together. And if you have a goal of something you're wanting to do and someone's trying to help you map those goals out, be open to 
listening so that you can design the best way to make that happen. At least that's my two cents worth. One thing that came to mind is just what's going on in our country today where no one is listening. The, the politicians in general aren't listening to most everyone else, and the politicians aren't listening to each other. We've lost the art of conversation and discussion and finding solutions together, it seems to me, don't you think? Yes, I try really hard not to discuss politics very much. Right. On, a, on what you're speaking of, I can feel a little comfortable. You know, my daddy, I remember when I was young, we would be at the dinner table and daddy would say, this is not a good sign that um, people are putting out how they're going to vote the signs in the yard. And uh, one of my brothers would be saying, well, why is that? And he goes, because it would start infighting. And I think he was right. And then he said, oh, zip codes, that's not good. And, you know, I'd go, why, daddy? And he goes, because people are going to think their zip code and where they live is better. It's dividing us. And then all of a sudden, he was like, I don't want to fill out these circles. And we're like, well, what circles? And he's like, we're all Americans. I'm just going to scratch this out and say we're all Americans, you know. And I, I think, you know, learning these little bit of wisdoms of knowing how things changed over time that has led us to where we are today, that I wish I could get politicians to take some listening courses to learn how to listen to GAN and not be looking for the sound bite that's going to be the great sound bite to have on the news. Um, it's not about sound bites. It's about running this country. It's about working together and seeing all of us as one and how we can make that happen. And so you have to be able to figure out compromises and the art of compromise I'm afraid sometimes is not happening um, but I don't have a magic wand to make everybody happy but if I did I would <laughs> yeah well that's and what you're talking about is the point of my question which is it's all about conversation and it's it's all about listening mm-hmm. we've lost the art of conversation mm-hmm. and, and there are a lot of reasons that we can probably point to as to why that's occurred. But the bottom line is that we've become very undisciplined when it comes to talking with each other. Um, and there's there's no reason that we should be in that kind of position. Um, there's also no reason that we shouldn't be able to ask why a lot more. And of course, the answer to that in part is why not? Uh, and mm-hmm. so we need to really get back to finding ways to interact with each other. And I don't know whether I totally go along with the zip code idea because <laughs> we we have we have a postal system and we have to deliver mail to people. And so it's all about sorting. Um, and as we grew, we needed to, to create something different. But I think it's a discipline of how we deal with some of the changes that we've made so that we don't lose that that conversational process in companies so many times the bosses know all the answers and don't listen to workers anymore and we see a lot of that when we have discussions about business that people don't recognize that there when they hire people there is a lot of expertise that that comes with hiring people um, and there's also a divergence of opinions, the most important thing is to get the opinions, to get all the data, and then synthesize it in an objective way. And we just tend to lose that skill nowadays. I could not agree with you more. And I even agree with you on the zip codes. But um, I would, would you like to run for president? That would be really nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be an interesting job. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? It is a, it is a tough one. You know, I, I remember on Sundays, mom and daddy um, like to listen to some of the uh, political shows. And of course, my husband and I always did. And I remember 
Um, Tip O'Neill was really good about sitting down and, and speaking with Kennedy. And I thought she was, why can't we have more of that today? Yeah. Yeah. So it would be nice. Well, going back to your books, um, you had mentioned something about you have a specific type font that you use in some of the books. Um, a specific font. Oh, yes. Font. Thank you for remembering that. So sweet of you. Um, yes. Um, so it's called the dyslexia font. And once I discovered this uh, font, now I'm putting all my books in um, that um, font. It, it allows everyone to be able to read <clears throat> um, my books. And what I really love about it is that it's an empowering book, but in so many ways. So kids who had dys have dyslexia, which one of my uh, nieces has, um, when they go into the library, they don't have to go to a special section of books that are just for them. Now they can be like everybody and um, find the books and go, oh, my gosh, I can I can actually read this. And um, that to me is very empowering and very exciting. Have you done anything to make your books accessible to people who don't necessarily read print or read print well? I need to do that. No, I haven't. Um, you know, it's um, it's very expensive to be a hybrid publisher. That's uh, our hybrid author. And so what that means is I have a publisher, but I also help uh, invest in the publishing. And so the cost can add up quite a bit. So I still need to go for that audio uh, books and um I wouldn't mind having my books done in Braille as well, because that would be really good. One place to get books converted to a usable form, a, a readable form by people who are, if you will, individuals with print disabilities, is there's an organization called Bookshare.org. Uh -huh. um, Bookshare is an organization that will take files and convert them to electronic media. They can be converted to Braille, but people can just plain download them as well. Now, obviously, if there are a lot of illustrations, the trick is to put in descriptions of the illustrations. But for the print parts and so on, it is an easy way to get access to, the, to those books for people who don't read print. And the the point is that the copyright laws allow organization, well, allow books to be converted um, for people who are not going to read print. And the, the only people who can check books out or download books from Bookshare are people who are registered and who have print disabilities. So uh, it's, it's a protected way. So the author doesn't lose their ability to to create an income stream and so on other than bookshare makes the books available for for people so it's something to look at but the publishers should really be looking at that as well because um, they should want your books to be inclusive i would think absolutely and even if they didn't the mere fact that you told me about it makes me want to do that because i think that especially my messages that I have um, are for everyone. And um, I, and I also think that being able to do something like that is giving back to the world. And I'm a total believer in that. And I am so grateful for you for telling me about Bookshare. Thank it's uh, def definitely something to look at. Well, tell me about the uh, little girl in the moon and the moonling series. Sure. Adventures. I'll be happy to. <laughs> so, my tagline is embrace your imagination and the moonling series definitely does that so the little girl in the moon lives on the moon and she is a moonling just like you and i are earthlings and you have an opportunity to discover what moonlings look like in the little girl on the moon the first book uh, the next one is The Little Girl on the Moon and The Big Idea. And that book is really for everybody because it's all about making kind wishes uh, come true. And um, the book, my, how a little kid will read it, it'll be totally different how an adult reads it. So I like to say it has a lot of layering. And I, 
I truly love that book. And then um, it morphed into um, the Moonling Adventures. And my youngest daughter is the illustrator for that. And in the Moonling Adventures, we bring in the little boy in the moon and uh, both the little girl and the little boy, moon, each one of their doggies. And they take us on adventures through going to the observatory and, and, and um, on the moon. And um, they experience in a, um, a simulator, just like we would do back home on Earth, and they visit different parts. So the first one was Kenya. And um, I'll let you in for a secret because no one else knows it, but you get to know about it um, and all your audience. And that is uh, my daughter is working on the Moonling Adventures uh, birds around the world. And so I'm very excited about that one. And that be um, a sequel. Um, yes. So we'll have mm-hmm. several. Um, and, and the purpose of these books is the Moonling Adventures again, is how much we are alike than different. So they live in Tycho town and Tycho is the largest crater on the moon that we can see from here on earth. And so I build in ways that science and teachers can use this for curriculum, but also, again, trying to show how much, no matter where we are in the world, um, how we love different animals, how we enjoy different birds. And so find these similarities that connect us so that we can have moments to just have peace and tranquility because we're all humans and we share this globe together. And so that's really the purpose of uh, the home moonling adventures. So this whole thing with the moonling adventures is fascinating, except how do they uh, survive up there without an atmosphere on the moon? Let's get technical here. (laughs) <laughs> uh, excellent question. So I actually have one where you meet Moxie, the little girl on the moon's doggy, and you go on a um, a tour of Tycho Town and you discover that um, as you go inside the crater that um, you there, there's this huge bubble and this big bubble allows them to be able to uh, breathe inside their town. And, um, and then also the, there they, they have a fake gravity going on because their scientists are so smart, they can figure all that out. But when wow. they're on the actual surface of the moon, then just like um, our astronauts, they, even the doggies have special <laughs> shoes that keep them grounded. And so um, I, that's how I worked it all out. And I even have a whole backstory of all that, that one day it'll come out. And another well, book. Well, the, um, the only problem with living on the moon, it's my discomfort with living on the moon, is without an atmosphere, uh, they must get bombarded by a whole lot more meteors than, uh, than we get hit with. Yes. Those rocks come that. from anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. But. To enter Taika Town, you actually have to press this one little rock um, that's on the surface, and you enter this uh, inside the cavity of the moon, and so it's a whole new world. Because so, it's your imagination. <laughs> well, sure. Well, there's there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it's just that you do have to deal with the meteors and all that, and you know, uh, we, you, but not you have if a, you're inside. <laughs> not if you're inside. No, that I understand. Yeah, yeah, but it's being yeah. on the out. And and of yeah. course, if the meteors hit the bubble, does that get noisy? So there's another mm-hmm. uh, question for you to explore. I will have to explore that. <laughs> have to think Thank about that. Thank you so yeah. much. I will. Aren't I, I such a big help? <laughs> <laughs> you, I love it because you're getting my imagination going. But I also have this book called A Song of Peace. And um, it's about a little boy named Tommy. And he just wants peace on earth. And there's a twist to it at the end uh, because a lot of books are written about peace. Um, so I have a fun, unique little twist to it. And it just won a couple of awards. And so I'm very proud of it. And right now, with everything going on, one thing we could do is everybody 
take a deep breath and just say the word peace over and over and over and put it out there. Which goes back to what we talked about earlier with conversations and listening. Yes, it sure does. What kind of research or how do you do research for your books? I'm, I'm assuming just by listening to you that a lot of thought and research goes into what you do. Thank you. So with the children's books, they um, come to me and I'm inspired. When it comes to the Moonling Adventures, yes, I do a lot of research. I needed to really study birds and where they fly and uh, when they're migrating and if what where they migrate so I can show and teach the unity. So for example, the, um, the Dover bird, it um, is in, um, in Dubai, but it also flies to several other countries, migrates into the United States, into South America, and uh, parts of Europe. And that makes it fun because, again, it shows commonalities between the countries. And uh, uh, I always like to say Ruby because it was about my grandma, but in Rise, a girl struggled for more. Oh, my stars. I can't even begin to tell you how much more admiration I have for historical uh, fiction writers uh, because years of, of uh, studying goes into making making sure you have the uh, voice right for that time period that you actually have the facts correct about the settings and so forth. And, um, and I actually wish I could wake my grandma up from heaven and say, grandma, you didn't, you had a lot of other things you should have told me. <laughs> it was because the 1920s is fascinating. Oh, it is. And we, we talk about how in our world we've advanced so much and so on, but we forget a lot of the lessons that we could learn from before we, and I put the term in quotes, advanced so far. Yes, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And we repeat so many things. And so if we could just take a deep breath, especially you politicians, and <laughs> listen to people who have uh, lived a little longer and, and uh, learned from that and learned from mistakes in history so that we don't repeat it would be quite lovely, right? So do you um, hear a lot from other authors and readers and so on? How do you interact with them? And, and they must give you ideas and things to think about as well. Thank you for the question. So um, I've joined several author groups and I am always learning from them. And I appreciate so much from uh, seasoned authors because, again, I um, was an excellent classroom teacher and I want to be an excellent author. And the only way to do that is to learn from the seasoned authors so I really appreciate it. And I have a publicist now, like I didn't even know that authors could have publicists. And so actually that's how I met you. So kudos to um, my publisher, Mickey, uh, Mickey Matheson. And um, he um, is teaching me a lot as well. So um, I am a um, young author in the sense of having things published. And so I have a huge learning curve but that's okay, because that means when I'm out there, especially with students, they get a kick out of me saying, I'm on a learning curve, too, so let's learn together. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about some of your speaking trips to classes and so on. What has that been like? Um, it depends on what country I'm in, because that really makes a difference in um, the culture and how you dress and so forth. So if I was in Saudi Arabia, then, it, um, you know, I wear a, a baya. And I always believe that um, no matter what country you're in, you respect and follow their laws and their rules. And um, I had the opportunity and I feel very blessed to be at a British school several times in uh, Saudi Arabia. I spent um, a whole week there and was with kiddos from elementary up through middle school. And not only was I in their classrooms, had opportunities to teach some of them privately creative writing, um, read their writings, have one-on-one -on -one conversations, but also um, 
The principals at each school were incredible. They gave time off. I don't know how they figured it out, but um, where I would have um, all the teachers in the auditorium and they could pick my brains. And that was really exciting. And as a matter of fact, a couple of them have, are now published authors because of um, their experience there. So I feel very lucky. In America, I've been in uh, many uh, classrooms. And of course, since I understand the uh, American system, I um, can, you know, I, I'm like, you know, it's like, yay, I understand everything going on. What, what is it that you want me to do? What is the outcome? Because I don't do a canned uh, presentation. I want to hear what is it you want the takeaway to be? And when I hear what that takeaway is, then I design the program for them. I have them go over it to make sure it is exactly what they want. And then we go from there. So it could be um, from working with young children all the way up to um, so far, it's been um, ninth grade and where we've done uh, creative writing projects together. Good for you. It's really, I think, important to not do canned speeches. I was talking with someone else about this recently. And I think that the best speakers are speakers who learn about their audiences and who are even capable during a speech of when necessary, making a course correction or whatever to make sure that we're connecting with the audience and engaging the audience. And so as, as I put it, I love to talk with audiences. I never like to talk to an audience, no matter their age. I love that phrase, speaking with and not to. Absolutely. And besides, you get energy from that because you know they're listening and, and engaging in what you're saying. And so when they ask you a question, you're like, oh, I didn't even really think of that. But your brain gives you an answer. Um, it's very exciting. I actually that's, walk away full of energy. That's really a good point that when you open opportunities for questions, you never know what kind of questions you're going to get, especially with little kids. Oh, and yeah. I learn more from answering questions, especially from kids, uh, because they're not shy, generally speaking, and they're very curious. And it's fun to have real conversations. And they tend to respect you more when you're conversing with them, not just lecturing. Absolutely. Even when you're answering a question, if you lecture as opposed to talking with, they know the difference. Absolutely. I just recently, because of COVID, there was no in-person, but now some of the schools are opening up and I was at this beautiful um, girls school and the young girls um, had very direct questions. And sometimes instead of just answering the question directly, I would give examples of my own childhood because I wanted them to understand that I actually knew and understood what it was like to be a little girl um, or to be a preteen. And then from there, answer the question and the smiles that went on their faces with the question because they knew I was really trying hard for them to know I understand. Did that make sense? Yeah, you, they knew you got it because you remember living it yourself. Mm -hmm. And when people see you as an adult, sometimes they can't, even your own children, imagine you little. Like, what? You were little? Are you kidding me? I thought you couldn't relate to the world. <laughs> you know, and from my perspective as a speaker, I'm not happy unless I go away from an event learning more then I'm able to impart. And I can tell when that happens. Um, when I get great engaging questions, when I get an opportunity to interact before and after the event and all the things that occur, it, it is so much fun to be able to have lots of takeaways as a speaker. So it's, it's sharing knowledge and information, not just imparting knowledge and information. Oh, you are so right, sharing. And then you just, you're you're so excited and jittery that, you know, you just like, oh, I need a Diet Coke. 
<laughs> and Coco Kelly didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I understand. <laughs> Time for something new. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what's on the horizon book-wise? I know you talked about one sequel coming up, but what's what's next in terms of projects and so on for you? Sure. So I am working on the sequel to Rise, A Girl Struggle for More. It'll be a good while before that's out because I just now finished um, the the research. And so I've mapped out how it's going to go. At least is that going to be on the moon? Will that be on the moon again? No, this is the young adult historical fiction. The moon one I um, just shared the moonling adventure um, birds around the world in August, I have coming out of time to fly. And I'm super charged about that one. It's all about um, a little birdie who doesn't want to leave his nest. And um, his mama, um, helps him get the courage to fly. And I think that is something that will um, every person can relate to, even as adults, remembering there was a time that we were afraid to open that door. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm really excited about that. And um, then in October, it's uh, um, Charlie and the Tire Swing. And that's been on the back burner for some time. So, I'm so excited it made it through up to the top list for the publisher to say it's time to do that one. And that'll morph into Charlie and the Tire Swing Adventures. So, but this first one is all about how Charlie got the tire swing. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really, both of them I'm just thrilled about and they each have a different space in my heart for what they share and do. Who's your favorite character that you've created or that that has invaded your psyche that has come out in books? Oh, gosh, that's really tough because I love all my characters. They're all so special. But um, I would say, oh, goodness, I actually I love Harry the camel because he's all about he didn't like himself and um and you learn all the reasons why. And but in the end, he discovers there's nothing better than being who you are. And so Harry has a real special place in my heart because I want young people of all ages to know that they're important and they should love themselves. And I say should, but I mean actually mean I I want them to fill in their heart to love themselves because once you love yourself, you can you can accomplish things. And so I guess if I had to say someone, it would be Harry. Mm. Well, you said that you had just finished research for which book? Um, Rise, A Girl's Struggle for More. It'll be version two. It doesn't have a title yet. So um, I'm excited about that because it's based on my grandma's life, as I said earlier. And so um, it's continuing on to... um, show once you're in the workforce what it was like for the the women in the 1920s but it's set in such a way it takes place in Chicago and it's a real eye-opener for what life was like everyone always just thinks uh, I shouldn't say everyone but most people um, think the 1920s was all about the Charleston and so forth but there was more to that and you actually start discovering uh, and and there's a real uh, parallel to us right now too in our time world because you're starting to see um, the little tiny cracks that lead to hunger and people losing their jobs because they don't have the money to go and purchase different things. So I, I think a, it'll be a good learning experience on lots of levels and a fun read. I lost. And you. of course, and of course, in the the scheme of life in Chicago and the rest of the country in 1929, we had the stock market crash, which led to the depression, which is, of course, a, a continuation of what can probably be a very fascinating story, how to get through all of that. That's true. Luckily for me, it will end before that happens, but yeah. you, it'll lead it'll lead right up to that. And you know, I wish I would have been a better student in high school because um, I truly find history so fascinating and um, and I appreciate it so much more. Lots of research left for you to do. Yeah, so, so much research. Well, 
what so in your downtime you you garden you say and you have a a cattle dog and that keeps you busy what other kinds of things do you do um i enjoy singing and when i was in dubai i was in popular productions which is a part of the west end so i was in musicals and i hope to get back to that again because i do love singing and um I started taking piano lessons uh-huh. and uh, I don't know. I just love doing everything since it's summertime. Now I go outside and go swimming in our pool. And uh, mostly I just like to uh, look at the clouds and sing. Well, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's interested in possibly being an author or who wants to take up this kind of work? Sure. Right. You don't have to be published. Just know right now, the moment you write something down, you are published because you've written it. Find a space or your favorite couch, um, favorite chair, even if it's just you just have one room, find one space that you want to say, that's my holy ground. That's where imagination is going to come. And just write, just write whatever comes to you. Maybe it's like, oh, I love zebras today. Just write different things down and then just start creating stories. Your first stories are not going to be your best, <laughs> it, it, but the stories that just keep coming and coming will end up being, you'll just become better and better. And when time is right, you'll know when it's time to go for it. And uh, you're so lucky today because there's so many ways that you can be an independent author. Um, Blurb, for example, allows you to get your, to, to design your whole book, get it going. There's a lot of different places like that, but just believe you can do it and it will happen. And that's as good as it gets. And <laughs> it's great advice. And we have to start somewhere, right? And the fact yes, is, sir. I think, All of us have stories and we should tell the stories. Absolutely. We are all storytellers. The moment someone says, how was your day? And you go, oh my gosh, it was horrible. You should have seen what happened today. Or it was such a lovely day. I met so-and-so. It's a story and it's to be told. And even if the first thing you write about are the stories from your childhood, those stories can be morphed into other stories. And so we are storytellers. You are absolutely right. If people want to reach out to you and get a hold of you, how would they do that? Sure. So the easiest way is just to go to my website, dianefloydbame.com. Now I'm going to spell it because it's Please. different. <laughs> it's D for dog, I A. N as in Nancy, N F L O Y D, B as in boy, O E H M dot com, Diane Floyd Bame dot com. It looks like Diane Floyd Boheme, but we pronounce it Bame. That's all right. My screen reader pronounces it Bohm. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's my <laughs> husband's name. I adopted it when I got married. Well, uh, I, fi- I figured it was something like that, and then I spelled it. But I'm glad that you pronounced it. So, mm-hmm. DianeFloydBame.com, and people can reach out and, and read things there, and they can contact you and so on as well? Yes, they may. And they can sign up for my newsletter. And all my books are on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and you can order them through your local bookstores. Well, and sometime we'll have to talk about how accessible your website is and how to fix that, which is, of course, one of the things that I get to do being part of this company, Accessibility, but that's another story. I definitely want to talk to you about that. That would be awesome. Easy to do. So we will do that. <laughs> yes, well, I want, to th- I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I hope that you enjoyed our time with Diane and that you will reach out to her. As I always say, you are welcome to reach out to me. I'd love to know what you think. You can reach me at michaelhi at accessibility.com, and that's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I at A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com. 
or you can go to our podcast page, which is www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast. And Michael Hingson is M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N, just like it sounds even. <laughs> so yeah, unlike BAME. <laughs> yeah, correct. But I hope that you will reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Love your thoughts. If you'd like to be a guest, please reach out and let us know. If you know people who you think ought to be guests on our podcast, we'd love to hear from you about them or hear from them. Feel free to let us know about them as well. And of course, when you listen to this, please give us a five-star rating. We appreciate your comments and ratings and suggestions and take them all to heart. So Diane, once again, thanks very much for joining us on Unstoppable Mindset. It was my pleasure and honor. Thank you.